spend years on a project, <laughs> and, and, and most of you know that, at least in a kind of in a smaller way, you love talking about it. So what I'm going to do, though, I want I do want to try to divide this into three parts, because I, I could, this is going to scare you, but I could talk about the colleagues for like five hours. <laughs> I don't think you want me to do that. But, um, I'm going to talk about just some current kind of timely things that are going on, you know, i.e. the election. Then a little bit more, I guess, first about women in journalism, and then we'll probably get to Pauline last. Um, I do want to say something, and I, I don't want to forget this. I, I used to be one of the advisors for SPJ way back a million years ago. So, and then I was on the board of the Central Ohio chapter and, and the president of the board, so I, I really love SPJ, you know, ha have been active in SPJ, and I think you guys do a good job. And you, <laughs> and you really do, you've done a good job with programs. Thank you for, for letting me talk to you. Um, you know, I talked about it being timely. Well, obviously, you know, there's a woman who may or may not be one of in the nominees, you know, for the presidency. We don't know yet, but she certainly is a player. You know, this isn't somebody who's going to kind of recede in the background um, by the time we get to the election. And, you know, because of Hillary, there, there has been more discussions, some of it good, some of it not so good on the role of women, what, what quote unquote feminism is. And this is, a, this is a good thing, I think, that people are talking about, some of the things that have been said, um, I think haven't been so good. I mean, probably most of you being interested in journalism were aware, what was it, a month or two ago, maybe not even that long, maybe a couple weeks ago, Madeleine Albright, former Secretary of State, said she made a comment, I don't even know where, where it was, but she said, well, you know, women who don't support other women have a special place in hell, mm -hmm. and that, of course, exploded and, and, and all over the media. And, you know, I, I'm not sure we can talk about women, you know, for what's going to be, you know, Women's History Month without addressing this. Um, and I think I indirectly learned a little bit about this when I was doing the research into Pauline. By the way, this is the second book I've done about a woman journalist. The first mm -hmm. was about Charlotte Curtis, who was the first sec major section editor so, um, and I'll get to the reasons why I'm interested in, in this in a minute. But the point is, I guess my view, you know, of Madeleine Albright's comment, I, I, I just feel like, do I agree with it? Not necessarily, all right? I don't, I don't think, you know, all women should vote for women. I'm not even sure all women are obligated to support other women. However, I will say that when it comes to things like voting, you do, I think you really do want to know background. You want to know a little history. And I'm not saying, you know, you know the history, you're going to vote for this person, or you're not going to vote for this person. But, you know, to, to make an informed decision, I think you have to know what's been going on, so, some important things that have happened. Um, for instance, I'm going to give you some statistics in a minute, not many, that always astound me. Um, <laughs> they're, they're, they're figures on women in the media today or as of the of 2014. And I'm, I'm going to do that in a minute. But when I was you know, doing research about Pauline and the um, history of broadcasting in this country, I was pretty surprised, not to sound naive, but back in the 40s, 50s, even probably early 60s, um, in, in bigger news outlets like the networks, women very rarely actually broadcast the news. They might write the news. They might do soft feature stories. But they, they rarely broadcast news. Why? Because it was the accepted knowledge, it was just not really questioned, particularly in the 40s and 50s, that their voices were too high, nobody would take them seriously. And, and again, I don't mean to sound naive, but in the 1940s and 50s, that wasn't even that long ago. And it was just accepted. No, nobody will take them seriously if they broadcast the news. Done. And this was one of the things that Pauline actually did. You know, she, she was one of the first to broadcast the news for a network. Um, you know, other things that you hear that, that happen, for instance, in most workplaces, if you were seven, eight months pregnant, you, know, you, you didn't go to work that day. You just didn't. You know, and that, that was accepted. Um, that, and, and, and not that long ago. You know, but that's why the difference, you know, if you, if you go to Rome and you see the ruins and you know they, they you know they fought each other other to the death. 
no, that's not a good thing. But you said, oh, that was a million years ago. That was in ancient Rome, back way back when. This was here, and it wasn't that long ago. Um, so I guess that's what I, you know, when I hear these things, I look up and I, I just say, that's pretty amazing. So that's what I mean when I say, just be educated, you know, that's all. And then if you know that, then, then you can make your decisions. Um, and this is something else that, that surprises me. There's, uh, figures like this have not changed that much in the last 10 years. As of 2014, all right, um, at the Top 25 biggest daily newspapers in the country, three women at them. Now, as of 2014. Um, at dailies with less than 100,000, so we've got a few more. Dailies with less than 100,000, top women editors, eight. And I, I don't have a number, but you know, there are a lot of dailies under 100,000. Um, now, we, I can look around the room and I look in my class, my, all my classes, roughly two thirds women. And I think the figure might be a little more for how many people, how many women and students. Um, okay, so so you know, two thirds or more men uh, make up 69% of all TV news employees. So women less than half. Um, men make up 69% of new TV news directors. That's up very slightly from 2013, a percentage point or so. 63% of newspapers have one woman as one of the top three editors. We I think, you know, we're getting a trend here. And, and this just hasn't changed that much. I mean, I, over the years, have given talks on women in journals, or been on panels. And I can tell you, 10 years ago, the figures were not all that different. You know, I don't mean to sound pessimistic here, but they, they just haven't, they haven't changed that much. They've changed over the years. You know, they probably changed over 20, 25 years. So, um, oh, one, one pretty telling figure, if you think about it, 74% of all guests on, on the TV Sunday talk shows are men. Now, these are the authorities, right? If you're on one of the TV a Sunday talk shows, it means you have to be an expert. You know, three-fourths of them are men. There have to be women, you know, more and more women that know things other than that. So, again, um, it, is, it is a little discouraging. Maybe it'll, maybe it'll go up. Maybe it'll go up. So, just become educated, that's all. Vote, vote for whoever you want to vote for. But, but just become educated and know what happened, you know, before you were All right. Now, the, you know, it kind of begs the question, and this is kind of where Pauline, why I find Pauline so intriguing. And the question is, are, are women obligated to help other women, to quote unquote help other women, you know, in, in newsrooms, in the workplace? And that's a tough question. I mean, I think. I think the answer is probably no. Um, you know, I don't know if you're obligated to help anybody else. And I'm, I'm not sure men are obligated to help other men are obligated to help women. Um, but my point in all this is, if you're in a certain environment, let's say mostly mostly male, as Pauline Frederick was, just being there and succeeding helps others. So just being there, doing your job, doing it well. Um, if you're, you're already kind of a role model. Um, and I'm, in my biography writing class, I'm, I'm gonna embarrass David here, who's in the class. We, we, we look at papers that have been done in the past about, of it, about women, and women writers. And there was one that we looked into uh, about a woman named Mary Garber, who was one of the first female sports writers. She worked in North Carolina. And there was a great phrase, <laughs> gonna embarrass David here, that David had in his critique of that paper, and he called Garber a quote-unquote accidental feminist. And I thought, uh, and I wrote, I said, this is really a great phrase. She was an accidental feminist. She wasn't, you know, um, demonstrating in the street, carrying the flag. But the fact that she was there, did the job, <coughs> did it well, did it for, I don't know, what was it, 50 or 60 years, really helped other women. Because it's it's human nature. Then I think a lot of the men would say, "Wow, she's good. Wow, she did the job." I mean, one of the great things about working teaching at OU, many of our graduates get jobs in places and they do a good job. So what do we hear? The employer calls us and says, "We had so and so, so good. We want another another one of your graduates." You know, um, and it's kind of the same thing. So so once you have you're in this environment, you know where you. It helps just doing a good job. 
Um, so I think, you know, when, when I was working on the Pauline Frederick biography, I talked to a couple women who were also pioneering broadcasters. Um, and, and I'm talking about women who kind of started being on the networks in particular in the probably the early 70s, which is pretty late when you think it was almost male dominated, completely male dominated, completely. And including somebody named Marlene Sanders, who was one of the first reporters, she worked, uh, broadcast reporters, she worked for ABC, and she actually, great person, she unfortunately died about a year ago. She wrote the forward to the book. And one of the questions that I asked her, and I asked other women like her, um, you know, I said, so did you network? Did you, you know, get together with, with the three or four other women reporters on the networks, like the person from CBS or whatever? And <coughs> I look at a similar answer that others did. She said, are you kidding? We, we didn't have time. We were, <coughs> we were doing stories. We were running from, you know, getting on planes. We did not have the time to, to actually help each other. So, you know, that really speaks to do the job, do the job well, um, and you serve, you know, in a way for others uh, who come after you. Now, having said that, one of the things I admired about Pauline was the, you know, I've read other biograph biographies of people who might have worked with her to see if she was mentioned, men and women, and a continuing theme was she did help other people. I mean, that was just the icing on the cake. I mean, it was, you know, it was nice. It was nice that, and after she died, you know, people who, who still work in broadcasting. You know, I remember when I was young, she helped, she helped a lot of very young um, journalists. You know, she showed me the rope. She was very patient, et cetera, et cetera. But the point is, for women, just being one of the, being the first, actually, I was say being one of the first and succeeding. So, you know, for what it's worth, I'm not, again, I'm not sure you have to carry the flag and, you know, be out there. Have, you do have to do the job, and you have to do it well. Um, that, that's that's absolutely vital. Oh, okay. I'm with you. <laughs> um, so let me get into into you know Pauline a little bit. There she is. I that's the cover of the book. I love that picture because if you can see the big mic there, that's the way it used to be. You see the pearls. Um, you know, women would. <laughs> it's almost kind of funny. Women, no matter where you work, you come to work with high heels, pearls, you know, um, perfectly made up. That's when she, that was probably, I think, from the late 40s. That's the era on that. And let me just give you a thumbnail of who Pauline was. And I'm not going to talk super long about Pauline because I want questions, but let me just tell you some of the things um, that she did and how she got started in the, in the business. Um, she, she was like, I, I compare her to, to two people, two, uh, two fictional people. If you've seen the movie Forrest Gump, which probably a lot of you have, Forrest Gump was like around at all these pivotal historical <laughs> events. Um, you know, you saw his face. If, you, if you're older than what you guys are, if you've ever seen the movie Zelig, it's a Woody Allen movie, and it's, it's the same theory. There's this guy named Zelig, and every time something big happened in the world, he was there. So, and this was kind of the story of Pauline. Um, her era, she started, she was born in 1908, so you can get an idea, but, but her, her era of reporting was in kind of the late 40s until the mid-70s, mid, mid, later 70s. And this, everything happened then. <laughs> I mean, you had um, the Cold War, which just started in the United, she covered the United Nations, she was an international, you know, she covered international. The, the, the World War II had ended, you know, the mid-40s. So then you have the beginning of the United Nations. You have the Cold War. And then the Cold War brings with it, you know, Khrushchev banging his shoe at the United Nations. You have Castro. Um, I, I, a million things happened, you know, in the, in the Cold War. You have, she was around when radio came of age. She was around when something called television came of age and everybody said radio is going to be dumb because we now have this thing called television and all the, the radio reporters were scared to death that they would become obsolete, kind of like newspaper reporters are now. I mean, there's a lot of parallels now to what, what happened to Pauline. 
And what she did was she just adapted. She started out as a print reporter. She worked for some magazines. People told her, you got to get in the radio. Radio's where it's at. You know, radio's going to, you know, replace print. She got into radio. And then what happened? Well, we got to get into television. And it was almost all kind of accidental. And she did not do it willingly, like, like a lot of reporters today. You know, she, she didn't want to, you know, go into another form of reporting. She liked where she was. Anyway, but the point is, um, and I opened kind of the introduction of my book with this, back when she was a reporter for, she worked most of her career for NBC back in the 50s and 60s. You would walk down the halls of NBC in the, in the news area at Rockefeller Center, and they'd have these portraits of all these great broadcasters, NBC broadcasters. I guess there were maybe a dozen of them. Every single one of them was a white male except for Paul Lee. And then, you know, I, I, can, I haven't seen it. Somebody was, in a book they were describing it. That must have been amazing. Everybody who walks through the halls, they see all you know, everybody's the same, <laughs> except for except for one person, and that was Colleen. Um, she was born in, in the small town of Pennsylvania, so she was not a New Yorker, she was not from LA. And here's what happened. And just FYI, if anybody ever wants to get a nonfiction book published, let me let me give you a tip here. Um, when I was trying when I had this idea and I was trying to get it published. I talked to a couple people, agents and also some editors, and a couple of them had the same question for me, and this is not unusual. Um, they said, you know, what was, the, okay, you have this person, she's interesting, what was the turning point in her life? What was the turning point? And you know, when you think about your own life, can you, I mean, maybe some of you can, I've had things happen to me in my life, or I'm not sure I ever had a turning point. You know, if I look back, I don't know if that was a turning point. And some of the people I write about, I think, well, they, she, they had interesting things happen to them, but I'm not sure. I can't identify a turning point. I, I identified two really obvious turning points for Pauline. I mean, and, and it, it made it a lot easier. And the first one happened when she was about 17 years old. So she was born in 1908 in, in the middle of Pennsylvania. You can, you can do the math. And she was bright, all right? She, she got debating awards. She got straight A's. But she came from a, a traditional family, you know. She she wanted to um, get married and have children. That was her goal. That's what her sister did. You know that she came from this kind of conventional family. So even though she was smart and probably would have gone to college, her goal was not to marry. She, she wanted to get married. And have children. So when she was 17, she had some of that abdominal problems. Which, you know, were considered minor. She has some minor surgery. They found, I don't know what they found, but it was serious. They ended up doing a hysterectomy. So she comes out you know, from the surgery and they tell her, and she is just devastated because her dream of, of getting married and having a family, she felt was ruined. So she said, well now, I, I, after college, I am gonna have a career. And she really did, and, and I talked to um, her only surviving um, relative who was a niece, and the niece said she was just destroyed. She, she was mad at her parents. She didn't talk to them for a long time. It was really terrible. So, you know, who knows, you know, when we all be here tonight? I don't know if, if that hadn't happened, but that was one of the turning points in her life, terrible as it is. And when she gave interviews 40 years later, you know, she, she I, I shouldn't say she talked about it a lot. There was at least one in, long interview where she, she mentioned that, a long interview um, about her life. So, so there's the turning point. So she, she went to, um, she, her, her family was were devout Methodist. She went to American University in, in uh, Washington, which is a Methodist university. And she was gonna become an attorney. She was interested in politics. And she had a mentor, a, a professor, who said to her, and this was, was kind of funny, because she, she ended up getting, getting a graduate degree, but she was gonna go to law school. And the professor said to her, there are, there are too many attorneys. <laughs> this was back, back then. Don't, you know, you don't want to be an attorney. There's too many of them. You write well. Why don't you be a writer? And she had done a little writing. It wasn't like that she'd never done it, but, but one thing led to another. And she did. She was in Washington, which, of course, is the center of, of all politics. She was able to get some freelance um, gigs, and she covered Congress, things like that. But a lot of, you know, like all of us, a lot of her life was just, was just serendipity, just lucky things would happen. Um, one of her, uh, I, I don't know if I guess it was another professor said to her one day, 
you know, we've got a lot of a lot of diplomats coming in. They called them foreign ministers back then, so kind of beginning with the United Nations um, back in the, you know right after the Cold War, or I'm sorry, at the start of the Cold War after, the, after World War Two. Said said something were like, um, we we read a lot about these foreign ministries, but we don't read a lot about their wives. What's it like to be plucked from some foreign country, you know, place in the middle of Washington <laughs> D.C. And so she said, oh, that's a good idea. So she interviewed the wife of um, the Czech foreign minister, writes it up, and on a whim sends it to the Washington Post, thinking this is never going to get in, but okay. She then gets a, you know, courier, that was back when we had couriers, <laughs> um, knocking on her door and saying, a, le a note from the editor of the Washington Post, or one of the editors of the Washington Post, we love, we love your story, we're going to run it, Give us more. Please give us more interviews with these diplomats' wives. And she did. I don't know. She probably did four, five, six of them. They were in the Washington Post. What happened? Somebody at NBC who's head of women's affairs, there was somebody, there was a woman at NBC who was head of women's affairs, read it and said, hey, how would you like to interview these people on the radio? Hence, she gets into radio. She says she does these interviews with her diplomats' wives. One thing leads to another. Um, and she ends up becoming, you know, starting to get a career. Now, um, second turning point in her life, she, and I'm not going to get, this is, you know, <coughs> grossly simplifying this, but um, she gets to a point where she has a degree, a master's degree in international affairs, all right, and so she hears about this thing called the United Nations that nobody had ever heard of before that's going to get started in the late 40s. Um, she works for a radio station. Now, keep in mind, she's not on the air. She just writes for them because women's voices were not credible. All right, so she didn't. She wasn't broadcasting. She was just writing. Um, and her boss says, "Would you like to go to San Francisco? They're doing this thing called the United Nations, and they're going to, you know, come up with a charter." She goes, "I'd love, I'd love to do that." She goes over there. She starts covering the charter. You know, the signing, the negotiations for the charter, and she has an opportunity to. And this is where. She has an opportunity to fly, well, to cover post-World War II Germany, um, Western Europe, after the war, all right, to see what's going on. And her second turning point in her life, which she talked about for the next 40 years, was the devastation that she saw there. She saw children without limbs. You know, she saw families whose father had died and they had no home, you know, their homes were gone. The stuff she saw and the devastation she saw post World War II affected her the rest of her life. And she said, We must never, ever, ever have another war like that. Um, and she really became pretty much anti war. And, and late in her life, she actually started giving anti war speeches, which is a great thing for a journalist to do, by the way, but that's another story. Um, and, it, it, and that was another thing that affected her out. Well, let me see if I can find this. Am I. Oh, I just clicked this, right? Yeah. Oh, all right. We're getting out of context here, but that's okay. That's Fidel Castro. <laughs> um, they look pretty cozy there, don't they? Um, that's when she worked for NBC, and she, this is when she was a star. All right, she was a, a, a household name. She she was head of the UN Correspondent Association, and she was one of the first people to invite Fidel Castro after the revolution to the UN. People applauded him in the halls of the United States. That's what a great guy he was. You know, and it's it's really interesting to you know to see something like this. And I heard his speech, and he's oh he was just charming. He was a very charming guy. Um, let me tell you. And, and unfortunately, things did not work out the way they might have. Fidel. Okay, this is the first George H. Well, George H. W. Bush, and he used to be before you know he became president. He was the U. S. Ambassador to the U. N. And you can't read what that says. But I'll tell you, it says something like, I'll paraphrase, uh, someday I hope I know as much about the United Nations as you do. So that's what he wrote to her. Because she was, and she was a little older there, you can see, she was really the, the expert on the UN because she covered it pretty much since its inception. There, that's kind of an old and poly part of the UN building, if you've ever seen it in New York. Okay, this is an, another one of her mentors. <laughs> This is the guy she worked for, you know, who sent her to San Francisco for that, in that radio station. 
when she, I think she had just gotten out of college or she was still in college. His name was H.R. Faulkage. That's, this is the check um, the, 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 the woman, <coughs> diplomat's wife, that she interviewed. I love the hats, by the way. <laughs> and there, that's, you know, the, the one that you saw. And I think, can I, can I get to the other, um, I mean, it's not vital. So. Well, it's the one. It's a file, and not a folder. Oh, the file. Yeah. Um, no, but don't worry about it. There's. Is it, is, would it still be on the desktop? Or? I think it's the one that's open at the bottom of the screen. Okay. Where it this, says, just quite, real quickly, see all the way at the bottom, there's a word document. That's the one she's referring to. It. Um, it, 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 channel Is Chuckles, it? she was such a household name that there was something called Channel Chuckles that appeared in the paper in, in a TV guide. And, and the come quick ad, they're competing with security and calling credit in there. So you could see that everybody knew who she was. She was like the top of a, of a cartoon. Oh. Yeah. 
she becomes their radio and their television reporter. One quick thing, and I'm going to actually speak to some things because I want to take some questions. One thing that Pauline really did not like and, and complained about almost her entire career was the fact that she had to look good on TV. And she did. Um, she didn't really, I mean, and she was attractive. I mean, she, there, there's no question about that. But she didn't have to worry really about her looks working for print. She didn't have to radio. She really had to work, you know, on the air, especially being one of the first women. And she always said, what, you know, men, if they look neat, if they have a nice shirt on, you know, and their hair's neat, that's all they have to worry about. Women, you know, there's all kinds of things, you know. They, they, she had glasses. They wanted her to wear contacts. This was a long time ago. Contacts weren't protected. Her hair, it's like there was all, there were always comments about, well, you, should it be blonde, you know, because I think she had brown hair. Should it be this? Should it be that? You know, what, what does your collar look like? You know, things like that. So she always, she pretty much complained about most most of her life having to look good um, on television. A couple other quick things. Um, I mentioned that as she got older, she became tremendously anti-war. When the Vietnam War started heating up, um, Pauline always gave speeches because she got a lot of money giving speeches. You can imagine this was part of her income. The older she got, and I know this because I, I read the, the transcripts to her speeches, she became increasingly more anti-war. So she would talk to, let's say, uh, a group of cardiologists. You know, she talked to a lot of people. She would, she would start putting down Richard Nixon. She would start calling, you know, Nixon and kissing the war monger. She would give figures about how much devastation an atom bomb would do and how quickly it would kill, you know, how many people. And I, always, I thought this was interesting because here's somebody <coughs> who's reporting the news yet giving speeches clearly her opinion, and I asked a couple people she worked with who were still around, I said, was NBC mad about this? Or did they tell her to stop? Nobody, nobody seems to think that NBC said anything to her about this. I, 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 that's one thing I'll never know. Um, there was a mandatory retirement age at NBC, I think it was 63. Colleen was 63, nothing happened. So she said, you know, great, I'm, I'm happy to continue working. And then when she was 64, she gets a phone call from a friend of hers at home, and the friend says, so, you're you're retiring, and, and Paul says, well, no, no, I'm not. Why do you say that? Because the New York Times said you are. So what happened was NBC told the New York Times that she was retiring. She tell her. And so it was really kind of a sad, it was, that, that's called a big corporation, <laughs> but it was, it was unfortunate, so that's how she knew she was The good news is she did get a job part-time with a new network, a new radio network that had been around a year or two called National Public Radio. So I learned a lot about NPR when it was new. And I, if you know who Susan Stanberg is, there's a picture of her in Newsweek and she's like 23 years old, <laughs> 25 years old. Um, and, and, and it was still building its kind of people. People thought NPR, and you have to laugh about this, was, was just this young person's, <laughs> this young person's network, you know. Um, and, and they, you know, the, these are people that they're, you know, and a lot of them, you know, they thought they were radical young people who were, who were you know, active in NPR. But anyway, she joined NPR and actually was quite happy there for a couple of years. One quick thing, Pauline won like every national reporting award you could win and she was the first woman. The DuPont, you know, a lot of these are broadcasting awards that are equivalent of the Pulitzer. A couple hugely national um, broadcasting awards, first woman. She was the first woman to moderate a presidential debate. It was um, Ford Carter. If you know anything about history, the one that she moderated was one where Ford made this huge gaffe for the existing president, said that there was no Soviet domination of Eastern Europe, which there was at that time. She moderated that. People say that that's how Ford that gap made for the election. I, you know, we'll never know. But anyway, so first, 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 first. Any one of these firsts, you know, you'd be really super proud to me. But she just had a ton of them. She had something like, I can't remember the number, 65 honorary, either honorary degrees or awards from universities, including Ohio University, the Carl Van Ander Award she got. Um, I have a transcript of her, I found a transcript of her speech um, that she gave here. Her papers are at Smith College, so just tons and tons of cartons of her correspondence. She kept everything, everything she kept. Um, so, you know, I, you know, one thing that, that, that people say sometimes to me when I give talks or when they read the book, they say, why don't we know about her? Why, you know, why, 
why wasn't something written about her before? You know, why, why was this the first book written about Pauline? And I think the answer is, it gets to the whole idea of whenever, you know, there weren't many women in journalism, so there's not, you know, there's fewer things written about them because their numbers are low, and it just kind of expands on itself. You know, when, when you know, when you're in the minority, of course, there's less written about you. When there's less written about you, fewer people know about you. On and on and on. So, so I agree. I mean, I thought I thought she was interesting when I first heard about her. When I really went into depth about her, I was like, this person sounds fictional. I mean, it sounds like somebody, some, you know, somebody would make up. I mean, just just the things that she did. So, anyway, um, that's Pauline <laughs> in a nutshell. I, I probably haven't really done her justice. Um, and as I tell people. <laughs> the, the information that I found out about her, both things written about her and in her letters, was, I probably used about 15% of it. Um, there, there was just so much that obviously I couldn't use. Because there'd be like eight books about her. You know, I'd have eight volumes and nobody would, nobody would, I don't even think my husband would read eight volumes <laughs> of books about her. But, but it, it really was fascinating. Um, and and I, I wish, I wish there was some way we could, we could spread more about her and other women like her because there are a lot of women, you know, I'd like to think Pauline is one of a kind, but there are a lot of really sensational, hardworking, pioneering women out there and we just simply don't know about them. We know like five sentences about them from permanent salary. So anyway, that's, that's Pauline. I'll be glad to take any questions.